guy who sells natural gas in Russia, mm. and Bob Kaufman, by the way, you know, he's, he's around a lot. Yeah. Uh, he's a, a wonderful, uh, you know, he sticks it to the audience a lot. You know, it's just a, he's okay. And, um, and a, a really good guy who's uh, involved in electrification, <coughs> electrification and, and um, up, upping the quality of the grid. And, I went to a couple of others. How about you? I went to yesterday and one, one uh, like this traffic one sits in and oh, yeah. you know, right there. Yeah. I hate it. It's like a shot back in the head. It's a so similar background experience. It's just each cut of bread that we're going to say. Yeah. So, so the other one I was talking about is a really good one. It's just extension. And there's like four people with really different backgrounds um, and saying things that were so surprising to each other and much more like a, a real dialogue. That, that one was just like Yeah, it's interesting how each of these panels sort of takes on its own dynamic, or doesn't. Yeah. So, but I uh, right. hope this one does. Yeah. No. I think this is going to be molded because of the numbers, molded yeah. more by the audience. Than Absolutely. The Yeah, she's the one who was supposed to come who didn't yeah. show up. Yeah. Habitability. Yeah. 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 Yes, I see him. He's in the back by the. Yeah. 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 He was he was good yesterday. Actually. Sure. Yeah. Oh, um, it's up to you. It's up yeah, to you, Mark. Sure. Why not? Yeah, he's. I'll tell you where he's sitting. You. Sitting in mean, the very back, paper, uh, near the exit. Color. You know what he looks like, right? You'll you'll see him. Yeah. Um, the first author was Michael Way, W A Y. <laughs> it was in Geophysics Research Letters, GRL. You thought he was going to have a nice, relaxing yes, morning. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, the title was something like uh, "Was Venus the First Habitable Planet in the Solar System?" Um, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> That's one. Um, yeah. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah, he's, he's making his way yeah, up here. So um, it's like a good sign. He's trying to find how it was on the, yeah, for being a sort of crude guide and it's a specific very nice mild history of the planet. So I'm just going to follow that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Great. We'll need to try to track down a name tag for him. That's a good, uh, yeah. good starting point, but we got to remember that's all it is. We'll let somebody worry about that. Worry about that. Okay. We get, we get him a fourth panel member. Who we are? A third. Uh, Dan, who I was telling you about. Oh, He's cool. a guy in the election. Okay. It's more than Mark? okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I like to have you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Dan. Mark yeah. Olson. Nice to meet you. Come on up. We'll oh, okay. Just so I can yeah, sure. Well, sure. You need some time to think about this. You I popped it on you at the last minute. I think minute. actually, uh, um, if we go. I don't know if they have one of these handy ones. Yeah. Because yeah. then we're going from. Right here, Mark? I'm going to yeah. sort of okay. talk Wait. about the planetary history and cosmic sense and the weirdness of what's happening yeah. now. And then you go into more like Earth stuff. And then okay. So we're going to go David, if you like. David, me, or Dan. Okay. Um, I'm going to do a quick intro to the panel. Are they going to hunt for your name, for your name plate? Yes, sir. Yes, they're going to look for that. Okay. <coughs> Who 
but you thought you would have a nice quiet one. <laughs> well, this is fine. I mean, what, this is the, uh, I think. <laughs> we'll see. Well, we, we haven't even met before. Dan. David Grinstein. David, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Dan. And David, who are you with? I'm uh, at the Planetary Science Institute. Oh, that's right. I remember looking. Okay. Yeah. What about yourself? Um, I am in the energy industry, electricity, and I have a small firm in D.C. and I work a lot on, on uh, smart grid and climate change. And all Neat. Nice. Well, I'm really glad you're joining us. You actually, we need you. Yeah. Delurie. 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 I apologize right now if I... Shall we? Should we start? I, I was <laughs> we all good? Yeah. Everyone, everybody all set? Good. Good. Good morning, Boulder. Uh, I think we're. Uh, I hope everyone can hear, and the sound is good for our, our uh, panel this morning. Good morning and welcome to uh, day two of the conference. On can all right? Can yeah, everybody good? Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to day two of the conference on world affairs. This is the climate science and policy today panel number two one five five. Before we get into the panel, we're going to have a short public service announcement. I am that uh, public service announcement. I'll be very short. Um, my name is Paul Cure. Uh, I'm with the Department of Revenue for the Conference on World Affairs, uh, the fundraising committee. So uh, as a uh, organic farmer in Boulder, I'm very curious to hear about climate science and, and the uh, repercussions of it right now. Um, but quickly, uh, at the end of this session, uh, Ushers will have envelopes if you care to uh, join us in supporting the CWA. Obviously, you already have by attending, and that's very much appreciated. Uh, as well as, as we're all getting used to the CWA app, you can also click on the Donate Now just as a way to uh, keep such people and such uh, conversations going in, in the Boulder area. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul, for that. Okay, well, good, again, good morning, everyone. Looking forward to a lively conversation around climate science and policy today. I'll do a quick introduction of, the, um, of our speakers, and then we're going to uh, move into opening statements from the three of them. You'll notice we'll have, we have a special guest today. We'll, I'll inform you about that. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll have plenty of time, I suspect, for Q&A with the audience. Uh, my name is Mark Ruzzin, and I will be moderating the panel for you this morning, and looking forward to it. It's always a highlight to participate in the, at the CWA. Okay, our three panelists then. We're going to actually start this morning. With David Grinspoon. David is an astrobiologist, science communicator, and a prize-winning author. He is a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute and an adjunct professor of astrophysical and planetary science at the University of Colorado. Uh, and he has done research focusing on climate evolution, on Earth-like planets, and the potential conditions for life elsewhere in the universe. And we'll look forward to David's comments. I'm going to keep the bios brief. You can look in the, the, the get all the details if you'd like. Uh, second up will be Carrie Emanuel. Carrie is the Cecil and Ida Green Professor of Atmospheric Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he has been on the faculty since 1981 after spending three years at UCLA. His research interests focus on tropical meteorology and climate with a specialty in hurricane physics. 
And then um, you'll notice where our other panelist, Tina, couldn't make it today, unfortunately, but uh, we've recruited Dan from the audience. <laughs> Not, sounds like we just went out there and grabbed anybody. It could have been you, right? Um, uh, Dan is a panel, is a, uh, and I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna get, I'm gonna have Dan introduce himself because he told me how to pronounce his name four times and I've already forgotten. Uh, hi, my name's Dan Deluri and I am a speaker at CWA. I've been appearing and will be appearing on some other uh, panels. Uh, my bio is in there. I uh, work in Washington. I'm in the energy industry and I've done a lot of work on uh, climate policy as it affects that industry. Good, thank you, Dan. So we're gonna, we'll have, uh, certainly a robust discussion around climate science. We've got Dan to talk on the policy side, and we'll look forward to your questions as it relates to both of those topics. But we're gonna start with David, and he'll kick us off, and we'll just roll through. We have uh, till 9.40, 10.45, so we're gonna try to play it a little bit loose with the time and give everyone an opportunity to speak. Thanks, David. Okay, thanks. Good morning, everybody. You might wonder, uh, what is an astrobiologist doing on a panel about climate science and, and policy here on Earth? Um, it's a legitimate question. Um, I'm a student of planetary history, and the part of astrobiology that I'm mostly involved in has to do with climate modeling. I model climate change mostly on other planets, um, although in order to learn how to do that, the first climate models I ever built were Earth climate models. In fact, the first problems I worked on in grad school when I was working on my PhD were trying to understand the earliest climate of Earth. And actually, early Earth, in some ways, is like an exoplanet in terms of our knowledge of it and our ability to model it. It's like a sort of variation on an Earth-like planet, which is the same thing that now that we're modeling Venus and Mars and all these other exoplanets. It's basically, we take, we start off with Earth models. It's the same physics, um, but we vary the parameters. And so in a way, it's the same kind of problem when we try to imagine future Earth or past Earth, variation on the theme of what's happening to Earth now and how we model it. Um, and in particular, with astrobiology, we, we consider habit, habitability. What is it that allows a planet to maintain conditions uh, that are conducive for life as we know it? And so a lot of that has to do with climate change, how planets gain and lose habitability. So um, that's sort of my, my professional orientation. More, explicit, uh, more recently, I've been more explicitly um, studying Earth and what's happening to it now from that broader context. I, I had a wonderful experience um, that started three years ago. Uh, they established a new position at the Library of Congress called Chair of Astrobiology. And I applied and was gratified to be chosen as the first. I was your ch first Chair of Astrobiology, you American taxpayers. Thank you very much. <coughs> it was a great experience. But, but the, the project that I proposed to do and, and did was a study of the astrobiology of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is the name that geologists are toying with now for this new time of Earth history where humans have become a geological force. Um, and it's, you know, it's a controversial and therefore fruitful idea, thinking of ourselves as a geological force. Um, and I uh, held a, a symposium on the longevity of human civilization, um, with, which is multidisciplinary and very, very interesting. And I've just uh, finished writing a book on that. Uh, the book is called Earth in Human Hands, but it's sort of that deep planetary, deep time, interplanetary view of the human presence on Earth, how it looks from the point of view of, of all the changes that the planet has experienced in its long history. And one thing you realize when you study this is that Earth has a history of catastrophic changes and even catastrophic climate changes. And it's even true, probably, that we are not the first species to cause catastrophic climate change. There have been some of these catastrophes in Earth history. Uh, there are, uh, there's biology implicated in some of the feedbacks that happen. And when you study human history in this relationship to the Earth, you realize that our modern civilization, and maybe we should put civilization in quotes, but uh, whatever it is that we're doing here on the planet, we're not the first humans to alter climate. That human beings have been altering climate for many thousands of years. So it's an interesting um, 
that deep time picture gives us an interesting um, perspective to say, okay, so what's new? There's clearly something new and different happening here. The uh, students of the anth Anthropocene, some people call it, say Anthropocene, Anthropocene, or our British colleagues say Anthropocene, whatever. I don't care what you call it. The, the people that are studying this talk about the great acceleration that began in the 1950s, really, after World War II, where all the different indicators of human presence on the Earth, sort of, that have, all the ones that have been sort of going up gradually through the 20th or the 19th century, they, they all start shooting up at this scary, precipitous angle. And climate is obviously a part of that, but it also has to do with land use and uh, the damming of rivers and sort of all the torquing of all the cycles um, of Earth that we are doing, and climate's a big part of that. Um, and at the same time, it's interesting that during the same time period, that's basically, uh, in my framework, the time period of the, the space age. Um, and I find it really interesting that during the same time period where we started much more dramatically changing the Earth, we also first gained the ability to see our presence on the Earth from afar, exploring the other planets and seeing Earth in context, gaining a lot of insight about Earth and how it works, but even more importantly, Earth observing satellites, which started in the 1960s, vir virtually almost at the same time as this great acceleration. So we gained this ability for the first time to see the great cycles of Earth uh, and understand the way Earth works in this much more profound way than we did before the beginning of the space age, at the same time when we were becoming a much more radical uh, lever, a much, much more uh, radical influence on the planet. And so it's another way of looking at um, H.G. Wells, you know, race between education and catastrophe. We have this growing, this explosion of planetary awareness, which potentially is very positive, gives us at least the tools to see what we're doing and potentially manage our presence here at the same time that our presence on this planet is exploding. And especially looking over the the billions of years of Earth history, this is really a remarkable development in the history of the planet. It's true that climate has changed, it's true that other species have changed the climate, but there's never been a species that's done anything like what we're doing. And part of what's unprecedented is that self-awareness. There's never been a geological force aware of its own influence. Now, can we make use of that, <laughs> you know? Or, or, or are we going to be this sort of sleepwalking entity that can say, oh, look at what, look what we're doing. It's not enough to say, look what we're doing. We have to manage to find some way to gain control over <coughs> ourselves as a global entity. We're good on the small scale. Uh, I, we're capable uh, um, as individuals and small groups acting with agency. It's an interesting question of whether we can extend that to the global scale enough, it doesn't have to be perfect, enough to uh, provide for our own um, sort of enlightened self-interest. And there are examples that suggest we can. I mean, I use the ozone layer as an example of a uh, problem that was recognized and we woke up and found a way to deal with it. Uh, we've got some harder problems now, but at least we have proof of concept that we've been able to respond that way. Um, so the 21st century is going to be very difficult in some ways. Uh, I'm hopeful, actually, about the 22nd and 23rd century because it's obvious to me we'll be off fossil fuels. It seems clear that we're going to stabilize and start to lower our population. We're going to get there, but the uh, problem is the change that's happening is very slow and there's going to be a certain amount of pain and suffering and displacement along the way. And what kind of a world will uh, physically will we um, be bequeathing to our 22nd and 23rd century descendants is a is a daunting question. Um, the way I look at it, um, the 20, this might sound strange, but the 21st century, if we do this wrong, could be as bad as the 20th century. And when I say that, people say, oh, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? The 20th century was great. And then I say, well, it might have been great for you and for me, my family, or some of us, a lot of us, not all of us, but for the hundreds of millions of people that died in the wars and famines and displacement, it wasn't so great. And to me, that's the same scale of tragedy that we're facing in the 21st century if we don't do this right. So it's a race between this awareness, which we have the tools for first time with climate models, supercomputers, with Earth observing satellites, and um, the, the fact that we have set in motion changes and economic um, realities that are, that we are bending those curves, but can we bend them fast enough. Finally, just really briefly, uh, I'm sure we'll come back to this, but the big orange elephant in the room, we're going to want to know um, 
how we can survive or respond or how we should think about this new um, challenge that most of us were pretty surprised um, to uh, see um, overtake uh, our country and maybe the world. Um, I'll just say briefly, and I, again, we'll come back to this, but um, it is scary and daunting, but we did learn during the last administration that the president has limited ability to set climate policy. We learned that um, to our disappointment, maybe. Maybe we can be a little encouraged by that at the moment. It's also important to remember that the United States is not the whole world, and I'm very encouraged by the fact that the Chinese are coming around and canceling coal plants and investing in alternative energy, not because they've suddenly become global altruists, but because you cannot breathe in Beijing <laughs> anymore. And reality has a way of coming around and biting you in the ass if you ignore it too long. And I see that happening in this country too, <coughs> albeit too slowly. Um, and it's also, remember, it's not the federal government that does all our problem solving. A lot of it happens at the state and local level, and I think we're going to hear more about that, but now more than ever, that seems like a, an important thing to keep in mind. And I feel, and I'm the sort of perennial optimist, but I do feel an awakening happening in this country in response to uh, the horrors being um, contemplated and discussed at the highest levels of our government. And somehow we can try, perhaps, to turn that into a slingshot effect, where the slingshot's pulling back now. And when we come out of this hopefully brief phase, where we will be, we'll be on a trajectory that's not just back to the incrementalism of um, the last eight years, but maybe um, we'll find a way to use this to catapult ourselves forward along this curve that we need to, that we're moving along, but we need to pick up the pace. So that's all I'll say for now. I think my uh, role here today, I've tried the most useful thing I can do is to explain to you why my profession has reached the state of being able to say with great confidence that we're incurring an unacceptable level of risk for our descendants. Uh, almost all of us feel that way. We have been, as a group of scientists, professionally polled. The numbers come in between 90 and 97 percent. That's a very, very high level of consensus for scientists who are by nature skeptical and contrarian. Uh, and if you don't believe me, uh, go to any random scientific conference and listen to the discussions. There's a lot of, we're all about debate. So why uh, have we uh, come to this level of confidence? And I would say that there are a variety of reasons. Uh, the first one I'm going to point out to is actually the one which is perhaps most difficult for someone outside the science to understand, and that's just basic physics. Not models, not complicated machines, but basic physics. And I'll, I'll illustrate that by telling you an, a, a true story. Um, that's a story of a very gifted Swedish chemist who actually won a Nobel Prize in chemistry uh, in the 19th century, Svante Arrhenius. There's a laboratory named after him in Stockholm today. And he dabbled, as was the fashion at the time, in all kinds of things. He was very interested in climate. And he knew from measurements that had been done earlier in that century about the absorption of long-wave radiation by various gases uh, that carbon dioxide was the most important long-lived greenhouse gas in our atmosphere. And he was the first to worry that we might actually, we as a species might actually begin to alter the uh, CO2 content of the atmosphere. And he did some calculations. This is really beautiful 19th century scientists. No computers, obviously. The calculations were based on measurements a colleague had done of moonlight. I really like this kind of science, right? They knew pretty much, uh, they knew how far, obviously, the moon and the earth were from the sun. The moon has no atmosphere. They could see how much sunlight was reflected, so they knew how much sunlight the sun had, the uh, moon had to be absorbing, and they therefore knew enough physics to know how much infrared radiation the moon had to be emitted. By measuring how much moonlight was received at the surface, they could make estimates of how much was absorbed. And based on those measurements, he actually did a lot of calculations by hand. He said, you know what? If we ever succeed in doubling the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere, we're going to raise the surface temperature by 4 degrees C. 
Now, he thought it would take us thousands of years to do that. He couldn't foresee the acceleration of the Industrial Revolution. He also thought that would be good news for Sweden, and he might not be wrong about that. <laughs> uh, it's pretty cold there. Uh, four degrees C, now, you know, um, a century, more than a century later, and after uh, huge investments in fancy computations and things, the IPCC, latest estimate was that doubling CO2 would be 1.5 to 4.5 degrees. So he's within that space. All we've really been able to do is to add the error bars on globe. But we've also been able to understand what that actually means for us. What does that really mean for day-to-day -day weather and climate, okay? So it's important for you to understand, and this is a misconception I try to clear up with congressmen and so forth, it isn't based upon hopelessly complicated models. Uh, those models are useful for understanding some of the details of the system. The other cornerstone is actual observations of what the climate has been doing. And lots and lots of different groups, including groups like the Berkeley Earth Center, who were very skeptical of the way we climate scientists had done measurements or compilation of the Earth's temperature, came to the same conclusion. There is no question that the planet's warming up. And it's not just temperature measurements, and it's not just temperature. Alpine glaciers are disappearing all over the world. All right? The Arctic sea ice is melting back at a rate that no model predicted. In this case, we were very conservative about our predictions. We've gone way outside that. Um, every indicator of these changes suggests that our Aeneas, 107 years ago, was basically right. If you plot the Earth's temperature versus the logarithm of the CO2, something he understood, the absorption goes more or less as the logarithm, not the linear function of the CO2, it's a pretty good fit. And yes, there are other things that affect climate for sure. We know that from the study of paleoclimate. Variations in the sun, volcanic eruptions, for example. While we've been measuring the sun very accurately since 1980, solar output is slightly diminished. Um, and we keep track of volcanic eruptions. The, you know, the Occam's razor here is really very, very sharp. We're warming the climate. And we have a, a carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere 400, over 400 parts per million, which we haven't seen probably in three million years. All right. We're really pushing the system hard. Now, you'd think that anybody with a, a small c conservative mindset would look at this risk and say, you know, we really ought to be doing something about this. And it, 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 it's something that I've struggled and not succeeded in understanding about why people who call themselves conservative say, oh no, let's just you know, spend a day and pay tomorrow. That's not a conservative attitude, right? Um, what are we talking about? And I think this panel will probably end up focusing more on the policy. What do we actually do about this? Because that's, at this point in our history, that's the main question. Uh, you can look to my group to provide more detailed projections about what will happen. But I have to tell you that where my profession is concerned, I don't want your expectations to be very high. All right? I think we've done what we can do, and we're going to get better at it. But if you wait for us to narrow the rather large spread and uncertainty, I don't think we can do that. We actually are pretty good, I think, and I, I regard this as a measure of wisdom, of understanding our own ignorance, the level of our own ignorance. We're not uh, immodest physicists who think we know everything. No, but if you forecast the weather, let alone climate, you become humble very quickly, all right? We know that there are limits to that. I don't think we're going to beat down the uncertainty in climate projections very much. I, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think so. We have to live. Almost all serious problems of risk are um, tempered with uncertainty. Okay, There's going to be a lot of uncertainty in this. Uh, but I want to also emphasize right now we're on track to do much more than double the carbon dioxide. Kind. If we don't do anything, uh, in the next few decades, we're going to triple it by the end of the decade, and that really is unacceptable risk. We should not do that if we care about our future. Now, I'm sort of, I'm no sociologist, but I do know some things, and uh, when we, the United States decided to um, 
to join the war against fascism at the beginning of World War, in the middle of World War II. Pearl Harbor happened, that was the catalyst. I think that's important because before that, Americans didn't want to have anything to do with it. They were catalyzed. At the peak of our effort, we were spending 40% of our gross domestic uh, product on freeing the world from this threat. Freeing, and we, it wasn't just money. It was many, many, many lives, right? And there weren't economists telling us, oh, yes, let's get involved in World War II. It's going to be great for the economy. That wasn't what was going on. Now we're in a situation where if we say we're going to spend 2% of our GDP, everybody, you know, not everybody, a lot of people scream, you know, this is bloody murder. Um, so something's wrong with our culture. But to be fair to all of us, to our generation, it's very tough for, the, for human beings to deal with long-term risk. It really is. So let's finally talk about the short term. This is something I've learned to do, even though I'm not a, at all an expert in this, just from years of talking to audiences about this problem, is let's talk about our short-term economic well-being. By our, I mean, let's say, the United States. All right. So. What's going on here is the rest of the world is waking up, as David very uh, nicely put it, to this threat, China in particular. Uh, and it's for reasons that may not have to do with climate. They're, they're choking on pollution. And for whatever reason, the demand for clean energy is going up. Okay, It just is. And uh, it's a $6 trillion market, the annual global energy market, $6 trillion, it's a, more than a third of US GDP. We're ceding that market to China right now. China is ahead of us in solar PV, it's ahead of us in wind turbines, um, and it's ahead of us in new nuclear. Bill Gates is building his pebble bed reactor in China, but not here, uh, because he finds the environment more conducive. Now, if you don't care at all about climate, you should care about this, right? Uh, the current administration says um, that it's concerned about the loss of manufacturing jobs. Well, good. I mean, we should all be concerned about that. What a great opportunity to uh, build back manufacturing jobs in clean energy of all forms, right? What are we waiting for? All the stars are aligned to do this, and I can't understand it. Now, I want to say one last thing. I, I hope my watch hasn't stopped. Am I doing all right for time? Okay. Um, we have very sophisticated time tools. Up here. Uh, right now, there is an effort, and I think it's it's a sh I hope a short term blip, um, to really stall any efforts to deal with climate change, which I think is unwise for us. Even if you don't care about climate, it's unwise economically. What I think you're going to see, I'm going to make a prediction of my own, you can test it in the next two weeks, is this administration is going to try to elevate the thing that has really worked for these people is to give people the impression that we scientists don't agree, right? But we do agree. Now, you can always find reputable scientists in any field that don't, right? There are reputable um, people in the medical profession who don't think that HIV causes AIDS, okay? Science works because there are contrarians. We don't object to them, right? That's not the problem. The problem is political forces elevate such a tiny minority to the point where everybody thinks the field is divided. Right? This is a really brilliant strategy. The polls done by the Cl Climate Communication Center at Yale show that even in the sort of reddest parts of the United States, people claim they trust climate scientists on climate. If you ask the same people, do we agree about the nature, the magnitude of the threat, they say, no, we don't. It's a brilliant strategy, and that's going to be upped in the next two weeks. You're going to see a proposal that, uh, that the scientific communication to Congress and the people be divided into a red team and a blue team, all right, to make it appear that it's a 50-50 proposition. Mark my words, I think that's going to happen. And if history is any successful, be any uh, guide, it will be enormously successful. I don't know how to resist that. We can just tr try to keep telling the truth about the climate, but boy, we're, <coughs> we're incurring a risk. The good news is we can actually do very well 
by tackling that risk in an intelligent way. And I think you'll hear more about what those intelligent ways might entail. Thank you. All right. It's great to be here. <laughs> okay, and since I'm next to you, you just give me a jab when I go too far, okay? So, uh, because I'm kind of a last minute fill-in, uh, apologies in advance if my comments appear to be disjointed at any point, but there are a few things that I think I can um, add to this. Um, first of all, just as a prelude and to show you where I'm coming from, I mean, I, I don't even think about the next century or the century after, because I look at the data, I understand the data, I understand what's being done to try and deal with this, and I think my descendants later in this century are screwed unless we do things a lot faster. And I'll maybe talk a little bit about that. So anyway, when I was uh, young, or maybe not, but I remember uh, acid rain. Uh, I grew up in New York and New England. And I remember that the plants in the Midwest were sending uh, sulfur dioxide, SO2, up into the atmosphere that was falling down on my beloved Adirondacks and Green Mountains as a, a weak form of sulfuric acid, and that was the acid rain. So we had a federal action, a federal law, the Clean Air Act, which took care of that by causing uh, plants in the Midwest to put scrubbers on, and there were other mitigation efforts that took place. And guess what? The acid rain stopped. No one even talks about that. That's not a thing anymore. But it's different with CO2. As has already been mentioned, you've got a very long-lived gas which can stay, and I'm going to defer to you guys on some of this, like for hundreds of years in the atmosphere. Am I correct? Hundreds to thousands. Hundreds to thousands. Um, you've got, uh, because of that, the key way to understand climate change and use as a basis for policy making is the concentrations. That word is very important. It's the concentrations that are in the atmosphere and then understanding that it doesn't fall out. Okay, you can't get rid of it like we got rid of the acid rain. And that's what makes this such a challenging problem. So you've got temperature, which tends to be talked about more. And I would say there, you've always got to be careful that you're differentiating between Celsius and, uh, and uh, Fahrenheit because you might think that it's two degrees uh, Fahrenheit, but it's not. It's two degrees Celsius. Um, and then the other thing is this idea of concentrations. There was an environmental group started not that long ago, maybe only seven years ago, six years ago, you may have heard of it, called 350.org. And they're kind of a grassroots advocacy group. Well, they uh, gave themselves that name because they decided they wanted to try and stop the concentrations at 350 parts per million. And here we have, we're already over 400. They've kept the name, but we're already over 400. And scientists, I believe, say that uh, we're never going back in the foreseeable future. We're, we're at that level and over it. So anyway, just a little prelude to uh, all of that. So um, you've got air, just like water, that are goods that sort of fall under the tragedy of the commons uh, concept and therefore they fall to the federal government, or at least they should, because if I'm in one state, I don't want the state upwind or upstream of me doing something that I can't do anything about. So most recently in the Obama administration, you had the, the first real attack via a policy channel uh, at uh, carbon dioxide, and that was the Clean Power Plan. Um, this, uh, you may have heard of it by other names, but this was the, the um, uh, plan, and it was done with executive action, so now it's being undone by the new administration, but this was something that set a target for each state uh, based on all sorts of factors, but didn't say how that state uh, would meet that target. It, it left it all sorts of tools and options as to how it would do that. Um, the good news is that the latest number that I've seen is 80 percent of the goals in the Clean Power Plan have already been achieved. Okay, so whether or not this is rolled back and roll back doesn't happen overnight, um, you've still got uh, a, a big achievement. Now, relating that to Paris and, and just 
so you know what I do and where I've been. In, uh, I'm uh, an official UN business delegate to these climate meetings that the UN has. And I was in Paris, I was in Copenhagen, I bring technology companies to these events and so on. But um, the Clean Power Plan was only a down payment on the US's commitment to the Paris goals. And remember what Paris was. Paris was um, every country, practically, um, agreeing to a target, uh, not legally binding, uh, but still a target that they would work towards, and there would be a system put in place where they had to show their cards every few years as to what they were doing. Um, but in the case of the U.S., uh, we, need, we needed and we still need more than just the clean power plan, because that only addressed the sector that I work in, which is the electricity sector. And obviously there are a lot of other sectors, agriculture and so on, which I probably can't go too deep on, but maybe I can respond to some questions on. Um, just a last word about Paris. Uh, for all that you hear from the, uh, from the conservative right about getting out of Paris and all of the talk during the campaign, um, three large coal companies just last week came out publicly and urged the administration to stay in the Paris Accord. And uh, my understanding from what I've read is because uh, they are both coal and gas companies and they think that gas is the future and they want to be at the table in terms of what happens with that. They also want to be at the table if there's any type of international work done on, uh, on uh, CO2 recovery, clean coal and things like that. Okay, so um, my favorite policy that we don't have, but I think we ought to, would be carbon pricing. We don't have any type of price signal for carbon. Uh, and that can come in two ways. Uh, the one that you naturally leap to is a carbon tax, uh, but the other is known as cap and trade. Um, cap and trade is actually something that works successfully when at the federal level it was implemented for SO2 and NOx. There's been a vibrant type of trading system. There's a market. It's worked. It's considered to have solved that problem, in part at least, along with some other things that were done. But um, with, <clears throat> with carbon, again, you've got this ubiquitous thing that is embedded in all parts of business and society. And so there are a lot of proposals. If the, if the election had gone the other way, I think you see a lot of action by now on that. Um, but this would be, there are different ways to do a carbon tax, but you basically want to, you know, have it right there so that it's embedded, as I said, in everything, either similar to a value added tax or whatever. Um, carbon tax, uh, there are some of the proposals will give it all back in the form of a dividend. Um, others, and this makes it perhaps more politically viable uh, with the new administration in Congress, is to uh, use it as a revenue raiser and use it maybe to raise some funds that can go into infrastructure programs. You've all heard about that. Um, or it might be used in the big ball that's starting to roll along on tax reform uh, because it would be a significant tax policy item if that happened. Um, cap and trade, it's being done in the Northeast. There's something called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. I think there are 10 states participating in it. California has cap and trade. Quebec has cap and trade. Mexico is headed that way. And for that matter, Canada announced recently that it will have a nationwide carbon tax in not too many years. I forget what the date is. And actually, some of their Alberta and British Columbia, and I think one of the Maritimes already has a carbon tax. EU has carbon pricing. In fact, this is something that uh, when I go to carbon pricing meetings in DC, um, all of the big multinational corporate companies are there, as well as the oil and gas companies, because they don't want to be isolated in the U.S. by not being with what they believe will be an international carbon pricing scheme at some point in the future. Okay, um, let me mention um, renewable energy. Okay, the, that's the obvious uh, uh, whitest of the white hats among the energy sources. 
Um, the thing to be careful with uh, renewable energy is that you see some really nice numbers that show how fast it is growing. And they're all over the place. I mean, wind and solar going like gangbusters. But that's the rate of growth. The percentage that they contribute to the overall electricity mix is still low. And it's got to increase rapidly for it to really make that kind of a difference. Um, and the other issue is uh, intermittency and, and variability. Um, you know, those resources are great, but they've got to be integrated into the grid and balanced by other resources, and that's part of the whole idea of smart grid that, that I work on pretty much as my day job. Um, natural gas, you know, better than coal and oil, uh, but it's still a carbon fuel. And uh, so people talk about it as a bridge to the future, but as with a real bridge, uh, you're making long-term investments into natural gas. And so just remember it still has carbon. For now, I mean, it's, it's great. Nuclear is great. And um, right now what's interesting from a policy standpoint is there are a number of states, I just read some new states yesterday, that have nuclear plants, existing nuclear plants, and they're having to enact subsidies for those nuclear plants in order to keep them in the generation portfolio as a carbon-free fuel, because natural gas has changed the market so much, it's driving out coal, coal is dead for generation, uh, but also it's driving out nuclear. And so, you know, we take our nuclear, grant, our nuclear plants for granted, I think. Uh, I believe we ought to be pursuing new nuclear plants. And when I was a kid, I protested against them, but not now, <laughs> we need them. So let's see, uh, let's talk about um, the new, admit. well, first a word on resiliency, okay? Don't forget the other side of climate, which is adaptation and resiliency. And that's pretty important. I mean, we're obviously gonna have an impact. It's already baked into those concentrations in the atmosphere. And so it's really important that we have policy, and that's something that a lot of states are doing on a state-by-state -state basis, but don't forget the need for that. Um, so finally to, uh, how much time, Do I, am I okay? Okay, uh, well one, I can talk about the international scene to a certain extent, but I'll just leave you with this. And there's actually, I'm on a panel later this afternoon on energy and poverty. And on that panel, I'm gonna talk about the challenge, and let's, I, I use India as my example. Um, you have the developing world that on the one hand wants energy access for their people, and rightfully so. And that's going to happen. Someone is going to give it to them, and it's a question of how they get it, whether they get it through renewable resources and microgrids and other things like that, or not. In a place like India, and I had a chance to sit next to the uh, chief delegate, delegate in Paris from India, and we talked about the challenge of air conditioning, for example, in India. Most people do not have uh, air conditioning. I've not been there, but I'm told it's quite warm and humid. <laughs> and so when somebody can afford a room AC unit, they're going to put in a room AC unit. And the numbers are staggering as to how many might go in. Now, how's that electricity going to be um, generated? Well, India has a lot of coal. I mean, they're building coal plants as we sit here today. And so if you're at the top, if you're PM of India, you've got you know, this question of providing energy access, but then the very same people you're providing access to are gonna be impacted, perhaps the worst, by the emissions that those plants are doing. All right, one word about uh, the new administration. Okay, so um, uh, last week, maybe the week before, Yale University did a really great study, and you can just Google it, I'm sure, and it showed that um, um, in all 535 congressional districts across the country, there is now a majority of people, this is everybody pulled together, that are concerned about climate change. And it had some other great statistics. So what we have is an extremely strange situation is where the people in charge are not reflecting uh, the people's views. And, you know, is that sustainable? Um, I don't know. Um, 
Those of us in DC often re refer to ourselves as someone who reads the tea leaves. Well, after the attack on Syria, we all flushed our tea leaves down the toilet because, I mean, who knows what's going to happen on this. But, um, you know, there is a growing movement within the Congress of members that are, especially from the Republican side, that are coming out and being positive on climate change and the need to address it. There are also a lot of closeted members on the right in Congress that want to do it. My main concern, and I'll close with this, is we're not doing anything nearly fast enough. You've got to remember the timetable here. The timetable, I mean, to 2100, there was a, a study that came out, it was peer reviewed, I think it was in Nature Science last week, and it said by the end of this century, we could have um, CO2 concentrations that haven't been seen for 50 million years. Now, I don't care if they're off by 10 or 20 or 30 million years. I still find that hard to comprehend. And so I'm, I'm pretty worried. And uh, we just all have to get in the game and remember we don't have much time. Great. Well, thank you, David, Carrie, and Dan. I'd like to provide an opportunity for the three of you to reflect in um, speak to any of the comments you heard from the other panelists. Before we do that, though, I do have to read how we're going to handle Q&A, and we will get to that in just a minute. Uh, as you may already know, in this CWA session, we are utilizing the CW app and a note card system to take questions. Uh, to ask a question in the app, which you have to have downloaded on your phone, simply select this session in the schedule, tap Live Q&A, and then insert your question, and I'll see it automatically. Uh, if you would prefer to write down a question, just raise your hand and one of the producers will get you a pencil and note card and you can write down your questions. I would ask any students who are asking questions to please let me know that you're a student because we will prioritize student questions. So please indicate that you're a student. Uh, and if anyone does want to ask a question to the mic, we can also do that. Just write down your question put your name and, um, and we'll see if we can get you to the microphone. Uh, just so you all know, as questions come in, I'm going to be grouping them by themes. Uh, so that's how I'm gonna parse through all the questions that we get from the audience. But why don't we move to back to our panelists and an opportunity to reflect on what they've heard. Sure. Um, I very much enjoyed what both of you had to say and I, I agree um, with uh, really everything I heard. I, I um, liked, Carrie, your, your point um, of uh, mentioning the word uh, small c conservative, because um, you know part of what what's frustrating right now in um, in this country and on this issue and a lot of other issues is the, is the extreme polarization and the um, you know utter failure we seem to be having of communicating across these lines. And there's some issues where we really do need now to pull together. Um, like they somehow managed to in World War II and, and, and respond collectively to, to this threat. And, but this, this notion of, of um, just seeing this as, as uh, um, taking care of our, 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 uh, our country and our landscape and, 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 and the world that our, that our children will inhabit um, doesn't really seem like it ought to be divisive, and, and, and it seems like, again, if we can, compel, uh, can appeal to those, those conservative values in that sense in all of us, that is one path forward we can imagine. And I love the idea of, of a, a carbon price, a carbon tax, because again, it's, you know, it's market-based. It's not socialism. It's not, not that I personally am against socialism, but, but uh, that's a whole other conversation. But I love the, the idea that you can appeal to people whose mindset is to want to uh, focus on market-based solutions. It strikes me that there's a real opportunity there for a, a uh, you know, if we, if we can get people over their entrenched um, uh, sort of um, shrinking into their corners on this and, 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 and appeal to the, the common values. But that's also where, you know, the, the challenges of communication here are really great. For, for scientists, I think I also like what you said, that in a certain sense our work is done as far as knowing enough about the science. We can always learn more, but we know enough to act. 
But there is this attempt to obfuscate that. And a lot of this has to do with um, this notion of uncertainty, as, as, as Carrie said, and that, and that sort of abuse of that. And as scientists, I think part of our role is to try to find ways to communicate where we don't antagonize. Uh, for instance, I found myself thinking of saying um, that, that this notion of um, trying to trying to uh, exaggerate the, uh, the level of uncertainty is the new tactic among climate deniers. And then I found myself thinking, I'm not sure about that word deniers. Because I think it's completely accurate. But I've heard people say that using it forces people, turns people away from wanting to have a dialogue. Because they are so offended, even if it's true. There's a, I think there's a truth. I think it's an accurate term, but I also am sensitive to the, the, the advice that maybe we shouldn't use that word um, for these people that, you know, they call themselves skeptics, and we don't like that because they're not being skeptical. But I think, you know, the way we use language, we have to be, it's not enough to be right about this. We have to find ways to be persuasive across these very polarized um, lines that we draw. And, and this notion that there's going to be a red and a blue uh, <laughs> government cl climate response, to me, that's, I share your feeling that's alarming. I mean, you notice what uh, Scott Pruitt, who, um, you know, is, I think is a dangerous character, you, know, you notice how he's talking about it now. They say, oh, well, we don't, you know, yeah, there could be climate change, and yeah, humans are probably part of it, but we really don't know enough to act. And that's the new, you know, Let's come up with a new word. I don't want to say the new denialism, although maybe in this room I can. But, um, but that's, that's what they're saying, is that, well, yeah, we don't, you know, you guys are probably right, but let's study the problem more. And that's, that's really dangerous. And so I think, um, I'll say one more thing. I, I, your analogy of World War II was, was interesting. And it struck me um, that it's not, it wasn't just that, there was this perception of national danger, and so we invested an incredible amount of money, and as you said, lives. But it was more than that. I talked to people in my parents' generation about what it was like, and they talk about these aluminum drives and tire drives, and that people got involved and changed their lives. It wasn't just the money, the taxes spent, but that ordinary people felt invested and, and were willing to sacrifice and change the way they lived. And I talked to people, I mean, my parents are really anti-war, and they, you know, my first political action was, you know, being pushed in a stroller and, a, you know, ban the bomb march and, you know, um, and, and yet their memories of World War II were we were all pulling together against this threat. And I think that's the, somehow we have to rouse not just getting the government to spend money, but having ordinary people on every level feeling invested and willing to think about changing the way we live. I just want to make <clears throat> some very brief remarks. Uh, Dan raised the uh, idea of carbon pricing, and everybody I talk to about this who knows anything about it says it's really the way to go. But what I want to do is because I talk to a lot of uh, engineers, I'm at an institute of engineering basically, an institute of technology, there's tremendous optimism among engineers, people in technology about technology to address the problem. And I'll just give you a very quick feeling about it. Some of it you already know about, wind and solar and so forth. But there's a lot more going on. So even Exxon, who's been not very good about this in the past, as you know, um, has been investing a lot in technology for using fuel cells to extract carbon from the effluent of power plants and use the waste heat at the same time to actually generate electricity. So they know that carbon pricing is coming. It's just a matter of time. They're actually doing a lot of research that will help us deal with carbon dioxide. So there's that going on. New nuclear is really exciting. And you may be very opposed to old nuclear. I am to some extent. And um, if you are, you should be especially enamored of new nuclear because it will help phase out old nuclear. And the new nuclear has a lot of advantages. Much more efficient, operates at ambient pressure. It's not super pressurized, so the chances of explosions are essentially zero. It operates at very high temperature, much more efficient. The half-life of the waste is not 10,000 years, it's 100 years. It can be buried. Lots and lots of advantages. We actually know how to do it. DOE has already done it. It's just the investment isn't there, 
because we're subsidizing everything else. So this is a policy thing. Um, the Navy has figured out, this may sound like magic, how to make aviation fuel, gasoline, from seawater, all right, in a carbon neutral way. You break, uh, you use electricity from a clean source to extract dissolved CO2 from the upper ocean and you use the same electricity to frack a water molecule and get your hydrogen. You have your carbon, your hydrogen, you combine them into hydrocarbons. Why? Because they want their nuclear powered aircraft carriers to be able to stay at sea for years at a time without having to refuel the airplanes. So there's all this technological advance going on. If we could figure out the policy, if we could price carbon, the technology innovation is there. It's roaring to life and in all of these different fronts. So there's a lot of reason for us all to be optimistic if we could pass this one hurdle. No, I'll leave it at that. Okay. I love um, yeah, a carbon tax I think is the best, but let's not think about anything as a silver bullet. There are a lot of things that we need to do to tackle this uh, beast. Um, just a, a couple of things. First, on the military, uh, one of the biggest proponents of addressing climate change and the reports that have been put out by our own military, DOD and so on, I mean, they're concerned yeah. about this. They're concerned about their bases and the impact on that. They're concerned strategically about uh, population migrations and unrest and so on. And, you know, there's just a lot out there, and they're trying to tackle this as fast as they can. But the other thing, um, I already talked about one of the guidelines that drives my thinking and what I, uh, especially in the policy, I mean, and that's the tragedy of the commons. And, you know, you've got to do something. When something is communal and no one pays for it, then no one cares. And so you've got to tackle that. But the other one is intergenerational legacy. And if you look at the reports that have been put out in the past 10 years on climate change that have forecasted something, they have dates for when something will happen of 2030, 2050, and then you find some at 2100. Those, I mean, those aren't that far out. And uh, the other thing within a generational legacy is that that can be an abstract term if you let it be. But I talk about the impact on my specific descendants. And I think that's all of us need to talk that way and not get caught up in the abstraction of, oh, something off into the future. Well, thank you to all three of you for the great insights. We are going to move to the Q&A session. Let me start by saying we need an eight-hour panel to get through all the questions. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so thank you. It's very, you're all actively engaged with the issue, obviously. We appreciate that. Um, I am going to start with a student question because it, it uh, plays off on a, on a point that you made, Dan, when you were talking to the delegation member from India who was, um, that you sat next to as you were traveling to Paris. And the, I'm trying to merge two student questions together here uh, around the fact that uh, we have this perhaps ethical dilemma where uh, emerging uh, markets or developing countries would like to uh, partake in uh, the amenities and the quality of life that those of us in the first world have uh, experienced for decades and centuries. And now we have this issue of climate change. Um, how, how are we going to help them move away from an economy that's built on carbon waste values, essentially, towards, and, and one that's not built on consumption and uh, and growth and move to one that's built on conservation and regeneration. How do we handle this, uh, this ethical dilemma facing developing countries who, who, who want to improve the quality of life for their residents? Well, I, I'm not sure about the carbon waste, what that thing means or what that, those words mean. But anyway, um, you have in the developing world, uh, I, mean, you, I mean, half the world doesn't have electricity, I think is a fair rough estimate for purposes of discussion here. Um, the, place, <clears throat> the places where those people are um, have some renewable resource potential, particularly of the solar variety. And the worst thing that could happen internationally is for a grid like ours here in the US or in Western Europe to be constructed brand new and have central power stations fueled by fossil fuels. And there's a lot of coal out there. 
there's a lot of oil out there. There's a lot of natural gas deposits in these countries or right next door to them. So it really becomes a question of if things are steered the right way and if you leapfrog ahead of the system that we have and look at things such as microgrids, for example, where instead of connecting to the, to the grid, you are just taking care of a village and you are doing several different things for the village and yeah, you have some wires, but you, you don't worry about the, the, the main grid, at least not for a long, long time. Uh, I mean, I don't have the answer to this because it is a dilemma but, um, and someone mentioned China, and you know, I wrote an op-ed a while ago on the smile is so wide you can see it from here, and I was referring to the fact that the U.S. apparently is going to abdicate its leadership uh, on clean energy technology to China. And as some of you may know, the China are already the number one country in Africa in terms of investing and getting close to the governments and, and doing all sorts of things. So, sorry, that was a little bit of a scattershot response, but um, you know, we're at the point right now where um, many developing countries are at a fork in the road in terms of how they do this, and we ought to be helping them take the, uh, the right path. Any other thoughts? Just very quickly, I mean, by stimulating, by develop, innovating our own clean energy, we indirectly provide to countries like India a carbon-free solution for their growth. And that would be a wonderful thing to do, not just for the climate, but to reduce poverty and to increase uh, the welfare of the citizens. So by solving our own problem, we can also help solve theirs. Yeah, and there, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting uh, and important connections between um, economic inequity and, and poverty and, and energy and environmental issues. And it, it's often true that when you give people real choices, then they choose a direction that's less environmentally destructive. In a lot of these places that don't have electricity, they're using um, dung and wood for cooking fires. And that is really awful, both environmentally destructive because a lot of these places they're you know using a um, the way they, get, they, they gather wood is not sustainable for the, the local forests, but also it's, it's a horrible public health problem, the particulates in the air from cooking with uh, wood and dung in enclosed spaces. So um, there is a convergence here of, uh, of goals of, of public health and global health um, if we um, manage to provide people in these poor places with um, good energy choices. Thank you for that. A lot of questions uh, and a lot of skepticism around nuclear. So I just want to acknowledge that and maybe the panelists want to speak to that. As part of a, uh, a question relating to technology and, and advancing technology, that could include perhaps geoengineering, biochar, other uh, uh, technological uh, opportunities to uh, extract uh, carbon out of the atmosphere and address carbon. How do we translate the technology, what, what's maybe the better way to phrase the question is, what is the technology policy nexus here so that uh, we can actually promote and advance these types of technological improvements and see implementation of them across the economy, not just in our country, but across the world? Is there, what's the, what role should the federal government play in that? A lot of questions around defunding of existing programming that would actually have the opposite effect of making it more difficult for R&D to happen. How does that, that all come into play on the te technological side, both the technology itself as well as the policy support to see uptake of technology across society? Well, I just, <clears throat> very quickly, I, I don't trust any government to pick favorites. There are these amazing technological developments. I touched on a few. The people who wrote the questions brought up some others, like mm -hmm. biofuels. There are all of these things going on. I don't think we're smart enough, any of us, uh, to pick the winners. And there probably won't be a single one. There's not a silver bullet. There are all these, a big subset of these will go. This is what the markets are good at. And this is why I, you know, yes, carbon pricing isn't a magic bullet, but boy, it would help and a withdrawal subsidies. We're just subsidizing a lot of fossil fuels now in this country, right? We should stop doing that and, um, and, and let the market figure it out because it, 
There are a lot of innovators out there. There's a lot of stuff going on, but they need to be financed and incentivized. And I think the carbon pricing is the way to do it. I think that that's a really good point that uh, that guided market development rather than uh, the government necessarily just picking the winners. I mean, because I, I used the example of the uh, solving the ozone problem before as sort of a proof of concept of a different way of dealing with these. And, and I acknowledge that it's a simpler problem, much simpler than, than fixing um, the, uh, the uh, carbon problem that we have now. But there are some interesting analogies. When it was first realized that we were harming the ozone layer in the 1970s, um, the companies that were profiting from making these CFCs, these refrigerants, um, responded by uh, paying experts to put out what we would now call fake science, and they, people called it a hoax, and there was a lot of disagreement. And then, um, and, and there were international discussions and meetings, but, the, but it, it took a while to come around. But then, then the world kind of got spooked by um, the, o the ozone hole started opening up um, over Antarctica, and it started looking, oh, this, this could be a lot worse even than we had feared. And then um, the world came around and the, and the uh, Montreal Protocol happened and, and it's, it's been successful. But one thing that happened was that um, the, the companies, mostly DuPont and some other companies, they didn't suddenly give up the profit motive and say, oh, well, we're just, you know, we care more about the world than our profits. But they, um, they saw the writing on the wall and they rechanneled, guided by these agreements and this um, this sort of new global awareness. They rechanneled their uh, their effort to make profit, and and they saw that they there was an opportunity here that they could make money um, selling the replacements that were going to be necessary when we phased out CFCs. So they saw the writing on the wall, and guided by this international discussion and these regulations, they uh, found a new way to make oodles and oodles of money that was not um, destroying the, uh, the, one of the systems that our planet um, defends its biosphere with. So it, 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 was, it was market based and allowed for innovation uh, and the pursuit of profit, but the pursuit of profit guided by this um, realization that did come from government agreements. So here's my take on nuclear. Um, it's a trade-off, but I'm willing to place my bet on science and engineering to deal with the waste problem uh, than I am to place that bet on those same people as well as policymakers to solve a very disaggregated and disparate uh, type of problem like carbon emissions, which can come from a power plant or come from a, you know, a, a cook stove uh, somewhere in Africa or whatever. So. Uh, I, I make that choice, and I think, uh, I think nuclear ought to be part of the mix and more. And I also think you ought to realize that, you know, we, we tend to be U.S.-centric when it comes to nuclear sometimes, but there are new nuclear plants being built elsewhere in the world, and there are countries with a higher percentage of nuclear dependency than here in America. Can I say something about nuclear? Um, it's a very difficult question, and I uh, appreciate the um, skepticism and concern um, and I'm, I'm glad for it, uh, even though I'm, I'm personally, honestly, sort of on the fence about nuclear. Um, but it's an issue where people are extremely ideological and almost to a religious extent. And therefore, there are pro-nuclear and anti-nuclear extremists, both of whom say stupid things. <laughs> for instance, take Fukushima. Um, there are um, people, it's such a polarized question that there are um, anti-nuclear people who um, publish these maps showing how Fukushima is um, making the whole um, ocean all around the world so radioactive that we're not going to be able to eat any fish anywhere. All the fish are going to die. You can find these maps. It's ridiculous. Uh, you know, it's... It's awful what, what's happening locally there, but the, the radioactivity in uh, the Pacific Northwest is detectable. And I've talked to the people who have done this work, but detectable at like a ridiculously low amount that, you know, where they're proud of how good their instruments are that they can detect it. Um, but um, so it's not a, Fukushima is not a global disaster. But on the other hand, there are pro nuclear people who say ridiculous things about Fukushima who, who will say, oh, it's just an industrial accident, you know, whatever, no big deal. 
uh, which is awful. Fukushima is a, a tragedy. It's, uh, it's a regional, local um, tragedy, uh, disaster, where for generations people are displaced and can't live in this place, and they still don't know how, what they're going to do, how they can even find, and what the state is of the, the uh, core uh, material that melted down, and they're trying to build this ice wall, and they don't know what to do with all the water that's building up the containers. It's, it's a terrible, terrible situation locally, regionally. It's not a global disaster, but it's awful. And so um, it's hard to um, find the realistic, have a discussion with people that aren't sort of, if pardon the expression, going nuclear one direction or the other <laughs> on this, where the reality is much more complex. The way I look at it, you know, the reality may be uh, to oversimplify, but maybe get at the truth. You know, all energy choices are choices and have trade-offs. There's no such thing as a perfectly clean, green energy. Even solar and wind, you're building these industrial facilities in these wild places, and, you're, you know, you're, you're, uh, there's some um, solar panels, there's some issues with the materials. You know, it's not, nothing's perfectly clean. Um, with nuclear, here's a caricature, but that contains maybe some truth. In the extreme, you might be balancing the, uh, you know, if there's the worst case scenarios of, or even bad, not worst case scenarios, sea level rise, you might be displacing um, tens, hundreds of millions of people from the low lying areas uh, in, um, you know, Southeast Asia, um, causing all, the, all this need for um, migration and displacement and conflict and, you know, all the, all the terrible things that can happen with clim unchecked climate change versus if we, if the whole world went nuclear. Are you, how, how would you balance that against um, 10 Fukushimas around the world? You know, it's not a choice I want to I have to make, but it's one way to think about it. I do agree with new nuclear, it's getting safer, but I still feel there's a, there's a little bit of dishonesty in the, the pro-nuclear because they'll say, ah, the waste, no big deal, you know, we'll bury it somewhere. There's, I, I think it's a very hard thing to have an honest conversation about. There are real trade-offs. It's not obvious, but I think... The, the, the first step is to try to get over the sort of um, tendency on either side to go to that ideological extreme and not be able to have an honest conversation about it. Okay. Well, I'm going to try to squeeze one last question in, uh, kind of a mashup of a number of questions that came in from the audience, but also which speaks to something that each of you said during your comments. And David, you talked about this idea of needing to move beyond increment, incrementalism Carrie, you, you phrased conversations around science and the work that the science community has provided to the dialogue, and now we need to move the, to the, a serious conversation about what, what do we do about this issue. Uh, and Dan, you talked about the need, similar to what David said, the need to really move faster. Uh, and I had several questions from the audience around what can people do, what can those people in this room uh, what can institutions do? What can society do to address climate change? And I thought it'd be interesting in our last three minutes to talk about how the interplay between the feds, federal government, the state government, and local government and local action can be tied up in, into all of that. What, is there maybe the way to, for you each to think about this? Is there one thing either at the local, state, or federal level or, at the, or, or for individuals to do uh, to help advance this conversation forward and, and make meaningful change? Is it contributing to organizations? Is it rallying out in front of City Hall? Is it writing letters to Congress? Is it all, I mean, obviously it's all of those, but what, yeah, what I mean, if, do you have? If, if I knew of a silver bullet, obviously if, if any of us did, we'd be out firing it, or maybe that's not the best analogy right now, but um, if, if I knew of some, some lovely seeds, I would be out planting them. Um, but um, but I do know of lovely seeds action. I think that is what we are we are doing is planting seeds. So maybe that is the right analogy. But I think um, it's multi pronged on an individual level, um, being cognizant of um, our daily choices. We haven't mentioned food, but that's a big part of it here, and it's also a theme of this meeting. And, and so I, I, I won't talk about that at length now. But there are there's a lot about the way we produce and consume food that is actually adds up to be a big factor in climate change and our daily choices in, in um, transportation and, um, and housing. All, the, you know, all these individual choices do add up and then communicating, continuing to talk about this, finding ways to talk across the great divide in this country and, and reach people and search for that commonality which really does exist in our um, 
in, if you will, enlightened self-interest, and of course keeping pressure on um, our um, representatives and um, meeting with them if you get an opportunity or writing, calling. Um, being in Washington and at the Library of Congress, I've had the opportunity of, to get to know a few Congress people from across the aisle and different sides, and it's been Honestly, that part, that aspect's been a little bit discouraging, but but also in, enlightening. Um, but but you know, all of us, wh wherever we can, those levers um, at at all of those levels, poli you know, national policy, uh, making it known to your representatives that you care, having those conversations with um, whoever you know across the, and we all know personally, family, whatever, across that that divide, trying to. Um, find that commonality, which does exist. We're not appealing to something that doesn't exist. There's a real um, common base of concern and a path forward that has to do with some of these um, solutions we've been discussing. And, um, you know, it's, it's all of the above. Very, very quickly, I agree with everything David said. Educate yourself about the whole range of solutions out there, the technical solutions that might arise in the right political environment and get your favorite uncle or nephew or climate denier person excited about the solutions. Bypass the climate issue. Get them excited, get them to write their congressman, what are we doing? We should be partaking in the energy revolution for our economic welfare. That's a good way to talk to your neighbors or friends who don't really get it about the science, in my view couple of quick ones. Roughly half of the states have something called a renewable energy portfolio standard, whereby utilities in that state um, have to, by a date certain, have a certain percentage of their electricity generation be from renewable sources. Uh, I don't know whether Colorado was one of those states. Is it? Okay. Um, but, you know, so that's an example. And the good thing about that example is you're not picking a winner. Um, you are setting a standard and let the market compete uh, underneath that. The other thing is on carbon tax or carbon pricing policy, you know, y you can do that at the state level. Nobody says that you have to do that at the federal level or you can, you know, join with other states that are doing cap and trade. Um, energy efficiency on a personal basis and community basis is still the best resource that we have and there's certainly a lot more to be mined. Uh, pricing of electricity, not of carbon, but of electricity. In the middle of the day, you pay the same for electricity as you do uh, on a day like today as you do on a hot summer afternoon. And yet on that hot summer afternoon, the dirtiest, least efficient plants are being put online to meet demand. And then finally, um, contacting your congressperson. I've been in those offices. I've been in those offices a lot, okay? I've been in the lobby, the reception area where I've seen the staffers answering the calls from people, okay? They get logged, whether it's an email or uh, an old-fashioned letter. Don't ever think that that's not counting for something. The numbers that arrive in a, in a congressman or woman's office are meaningful. And don't ever forget that. But then finally, just local action. Don't count on Washington. Thank you to our panelists for their insights and wisdom, and enjoy the rest of your day. Stepping in at the last minute. Okay, no problem. Great job. Well, I got to warm up yesterday next to Karen. Yeah, that's, so. well, that's, that's what we heard. So we <laughs> know the drill. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome.